Ada Paris, she's she's a futurist, she's simply amazing. Ada, I think you're there and ready. Remember, you've got 99 seconds. And remember, everyone watching and listening, questions, the little Q&A icon above the screen, click it, enter your questions, we'll pick some of the best. Ada, if you're ready. Uh, yes, I'm time. ready. Hi, it was you. Hi, uh, first slide, please. Uh, can I get the slides? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide, uh, this image is something called a chimampa. It's a ancient Mexican form of agriculture that uses small rectangles or blocks to create fertile patches of land on shallow lakes. It's a form of technology. Next slide, please. What has that got to do with this? Well, this is a starfish. It has no central brain, five legs that are interdependent. If one leg is lost, the, the other, it can regrow or it can actually regrow a new starfish. What do those two things have in common? Next slide, please. The answer is decentralization. It's blockchain. And that's what we're looking at when we're starting to think about innovation, especially when we're looking at what's been happening now around COVID. That the, the connection for innovation is that we look for a decentralized system. We are looking at the idea that what's the intention of the technology? What's the value? What that the idea that innovation can come from anywhere, it doesn't have to be top down. It's actually what we're seeing now, especially in the COVID, in this whole pandemic, is that it can come from anywhere. It's decentralized. It's a bottom up approach to innovation. We're seeing that technology is a tool. It's not the answer. It may not be the answer, but it may be a tool to help us, help us get to where we want to be. The other question is why now? And then we start to look at how we scale. And so when we start to think about innovation, we can look at, and I've heard some of the other speakers talk about it today. We go back to looking at ancient wisdom, looking at old ideas, looking at natural systems, looking at for the connection, what brings them all together. So it's ancient wisdom, new thinking for future innovations. Thank you. Amazing. I did not, <laughs> that's incredible. I did not get to hold you off. Let's go to the question. Lots of questions coming in. First one from, from Julia Smith. Uh, she asks, as a futurist, is there any one thing you wish you could have predicted? Good question. Oh, um, so I will start by saying that as a, the type of futurist that, that I am is rather than trying to predict the future, I take a philosophical and anthropological look at it. So I look at how, um, I believe that technology is a tool and that there are, you know, our behavior around the use of tools and the use of technology has been the same across different areas. So we use tech to try and connect with ourselves, our environment and with others. And so when it comes to, is there anything that I would have wished that I had created? I've not created, but I wish, I hope that I had seen this pattern earlier. It's taken five years of me mind mapping to get to this point of recognizing the pattern. And actually can see that the pattern that I've just described to you replicates in algorithmic um, technology, in quantum physics and spirituality in various worlds. And I just wish that for some, for myself, I think I wish that I'd seen that sooner, but actually we're in the prime time now for, to see that this is actually what's happening around. It's how PPEs have been done. It's how people are starting to come together to try and find vaccines for the coronavirus. And so I would just wish that maybe I'd see that a bit sooner. Excellent. Question here from Andy who asks, do you think brands need a defined innovation budget to do innovation well? Uh, I believe that we, I believe that innovation shouldn't be one person's job. I think that innovation is systemic. As humans, we're all problem solvers. And so innovation runs across the whole business. And so I think rather than having just one innovation budget, a bit like the idea of diversity, it shouldn't be just a diversity budget. It shouldn't just be an innovation budget. I think that it's, the, there should be space for the ideas to bubble up from the surface and those ideas, then you have a, a system or a framework in place to actually follow those. Because rather than thinking about, um, so when I spoke about this before, rather than thinking of it as a radical idea, it's an idea that I didn't know what the end point is and I decided to follow. And I think that's what, you know, it's about how much risk are you willing to take and how much money are you prepared to put behind that to see where the, where the journey goes. So process versus goal. Perfect. Uh, there's quite a lot of comments and questions about blockchain. Some are quite rude. So let's pick one out. Uh, Darren asks, are there any industries or products you think are ripe for blockchain disruption that are not currently using it? So I, 
use blockchain as a metaphor because I'm not going to, you know, I can't go into the whole, th the whole, um, the, the, the mechanics of blockchain. But I think that if you take it from the basis that it's about decentralization and it's about, you know, um, the fact that ideas can come from anywhere and everything within that system has a value and can add value to the final, the, the final point, then it, it, it should be right for anywhere. Amazing. Anna, you're out of time. Thank you so much for taking part. Amazing, amazing people. Thank you. First up is the great Lauren Douglas from Channel Factory doing a, a wrap of what she's learned from the last few days. Lauren, over to you. 99 seconds. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate being a part of this event. And I think that some of the things that I noticed this week that really spoke to me are, despite the fact that we're in sort of this crazy realm um, with all of the craziness in the world, I really remain hopeful for the future. I think we heard a lot this week around how it's time for consumers to listen or speak and it's time for the brands and advertisers to listen. And I think that's really powerful. Um, and I think we heard a lot about Gen Zers and how they're true activists um, and how it'll be really important to see how we continue that conversation and really listen to our consumers. Um, I thought that there were some interesting takeaways like you know, we need to start valuing inclusion over exclusion in marketing. We need to re remove the terms whitelist and blacklist and replace them with inclusion and exclusion. Um, we need to redo our keyword lists. Uh, you know, LGBT, trans, hip hop, pregnant are all keywords that I've seen on blacklist this year. Um, so I think it's really, really time to redo those things. And I think, um, you know, really putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to supporting, uh, you know, supporting black YouTube creators and black content creators. Um, and I think that that's uh, something that we're, we're doing at my company and, and I know uh, some, of, some of the others as well. So I think for me, I, I just remain very hopeful after, after this week. Lauren, amazing, you had eight seconds ago, so that's incredible work. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And straight on to Martin Wallace, he's the UK head of marketing at Live Ramp. His talks in Trinity titled, Trust in Charge. Martin, hi, how are you doing? You've got 99 seconds. Starting now, go. Oh, thanks, Justin. Hi, everyone. Um, this title is uh, deliberately ambiguous with a, a sort of double meaning. Um, on the one hand, change can be a good thing, so embrace it. Uh, on the other hand, I wanted to highlight how we've heard throughout this week that as we navigate through a, a sea of change, it seems that trust has never been more important. Um, the event this week as a whole has focused on Emerge Stronger as its theme, highlighting the, the unprecedented situation in which, in which the world currently finds itself. I think it also highlights the need to leverage change for the better, whatever is happening. Um, my colleague Graham spoke on, on Tuesday about using consented data responsibly to help build trust. Um, I guess I've been, been struck this week by how much trust needs to play a part in, in every element of a marketing strategy, not just how we use data. Um, Ollie from Mojave's talked about kindness, contributing value to society with, with integrity. One of the polls examined the roles of, of brands in BLM. We concluded that it's fine as long as it's genuine and done properly. Uh, Russ from Hall & Partners talked about how brands need to work hard to be relevant and so did Mark from Vice today. Um, and Vicky from Havish yesterday mentioned consumer power and big brands using their, their influence to, to make a stand. These examples all point to the need to show our customers that we're listening uh, and that we understand them. Um, Hannah from Tagger called data uh, a superpower and obviously as a live ramper, I'd agree with that. But I think with power comes uh, responsibility and it's those who use their powers responsibly and really build that trust uh, who will in the months and years to come uh, emerge stronger. So that's all from me and thanks to the team for, uh, for a great event. Wow, bang on side, Martin, great, 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 great seconds. Thanks so much, see you again soon. So now we're moving on quickly to, uh, this is a good, this is a treat. This is a video, it's a, uh, well you'll enjoy it. So let's sit back and watch. I think I've had enough. I might get a little drunk. I say what's on my mind. I've been wasting all time cause all of my problems are influencer reporting issues now i got 99 seconds for business and i got one more hour to finish i'm just trying to make it for my boss by monday morning i swear i wish i had tagged with 
in me, that's all I want Woke up an optimist I'll contact tag and now I'm positive Then I heard my boss got me tag a tag A decision that we won't regret Now I got 99 seconds for business And I got one more hour to finish I'm just trying to make it for my boss by Monday morning Now that I have Tagger with me, ooh, that's all resolved That was absolutely amazing, congratulations Yay. That's sort of thing we need at Nighttime Festival Right, we've now got a few minutes until uh, our next couple speaker, one of my favourites Sam Conniff uh, We've just had news in. We're extending 99 Club next week as well. We're going to keep going for the next <laughs> month. No, we're not. No, we're not. Okay, no, we're not. So, listen, we've got a couple of minutes, Andy. You can get a chance to do some poll chat, and the polls are on form today. What's yeah. happening? Well, for a start, you're going to press that button that says start my video. There we go. Oh, yeah. Hey. Uh, <laughs> technical problems caused by me mostly. So, a bit of poll chat, cheese, innovation. What's going on? So, now? I'm going to launch the cheese poll. Um, I feel this is a, a watershed moment in our careers that we've been very, very serious uh, people for, for, for 15 years now. Um, and now we're starting to make things up. So we just launched a cheese poll there. Well, that's not making it up. We have launched a cheese We poll. have cheese, launched a cheese poll. Cheese, great, isn't it? But which is the Grand Fromage? Stilton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> great. Okay. Great insight. <laughs> or B, uh, Brie, C, Dairy Lee for the uh, for the right. so that. Please, please get involved. We, we need your votes. We need to hear your thoughts. We need your insights. That's the cheese poll. Any other thing else to go with coming towards the end of uh, the last day of the festival? Um, early poll results. Uh, the Brie leapt into the lead. Extraordinary thing. Um, what have we learned this way? I'll tell you what. Isn't it amazing how brilliant uh, the speakers have been this week? I mean, how... Just listening to um, Hannah's song there, that was incredible. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, I hear we've got a performance coming up a bit later yeah. this afternoon. Poetry and song become the defining ways of getting. You don't across. get that in Cannes. You, you don't. don't get that in Mexico. You don't you get it here. Not yeah, in just here. Now I think we're going to move on to uh, Sam Connors, who again, someone known for a very long time. He, he's incredible. Uh, he's an author. He's he's a, he is a consultant, he's an agitator, he's everything, and he turned down a big award just last week, he might tell us about. Sam, I don't know if you're on and ready, you are indeed fantastic. So as you know, Sam, you have got 99 seconds to wow us all. Everyone, 99 seconds, can you hear me? I'm listening, watching the Q&A button, bottom of the screen, ask Sam some hard questions. Sam, over to you, 99 seconds starts now. So uh, there's an awful lot of talk about crisis, but I think it sells short the notion that we're actually in a crisis, in a crisis, in a crisis, in a crisis. I count five, but you might count your own because we can't forget the imminence of the hugest ever economic shuffle that's about to come around, nor can we forget that the uh, looming uh, election of a president that's going to define another aspect of a very serious conversation about racism. And of course, behind that, the new science reports that we're facing the first time we're gonna have a summer without ice on the polar cap, which is why last week the doomsday clock got moved to 10 seconds to midnight, the closest it's ever been since it was created. And if that's in any way kind of unsettling, it's just to put it all into perspective, because more importantly than all of that, there isn't a plan that sits behind it. So I've been thinking a lot during this lockdown about who we might look to, because our current leadership have got the least, most narrow set of experience ever. Two years is the longest tenure of anyone in the cabinet, and there are only three professions represented. So I've been thinking about uncertainty expertise and I've been looking for people who've been schooled in uncertainty, who've really spent their lives in it. I've been speaking to prisoners, refugees, people who run startups in um, townships. I've been speaking to some of the most successful social enterprise runners in this country, but only people who've born there from lived experience. People who spent a lifetime as addicts or smugglers and they managed to turn their life around and become Harley Street psychiatrists. And there's this couple of really clear lessons, some incredible ones about space and time how we think and how we don't let ourselves think. There's some fantastic notions about plans and how they are the problem, unless you have unfolding plans. There's a notion really of leaning into adversity and how all of us are so hardwired with a human threshold against shit that we can't stay near it. And if we can walk with that kind of fear as all of these individual fascinating leaders who've all had this huge redemption and now such positive contributors. And I found my way to the Santa Fe Institute for uh, uh, Complexity Science where I discovered there's actually a notion for this, the idea of anti-fragility, where like a heuristic, if you take a little bit of poison every day, it ends up becoming a medicine. 
medicine. And these ideas now forming, and every day we see another dis de 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 degree of one dimensional narrow experience that can say the kind of explosive nonsense that Rob was coming out with yesterday. This begins to increasingly feel like an opportunity to look further to the sides and the edges to find the inspiration that would usually overlook and not to the leaders who will definitely let us down. Um, amazing. <laughs> you're aware of 99 seconds, which is breaking the rules. I can stop this like what you say. So let me, let me talk this question from me first. You've been on a, on a mission to turn everyone into pirates over the last few years. Uh, how's that mission changed since the pandemic came into our lives? Uh, we've been inundated with people saying this message is more important than ever. Um, I've handed over control, as I think uh, is right, to a young woman who's been my right-hand pirate for a while. She's now the, the captain of the Beemore pirate ship. There's a regular open mutiny session uh, taking place every two weeks, and there's people there from all walks of life, backgrounds, business organizations, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and, and everything else discussing the mutinies that they're bringing about in this moment of let's not call it uncertainty, but of total opportunity. Um, and a new book, a sequel called How to Be More Pirate is going to be out in September, which is a synthesis of interviews of some of the most significant stories of rebellion that the book brought into the world. Excellent. If you haven't read the first book, read it. It's one of my favourite the last few years. So the question is from Julia. Julia, amazing. You definitely win the prize for Andy's Homemade Marmite for the best questions this week. Julia asks, has Sam won the prize for the most words in 99 seconds? She says, I'm curious, Sam, in these uncertain times, is there one thing that you can be certain of? Yeah, yourself, instinct. There's never been a, a time for the greatest leadership tool to play more and more of a role. And the more we look for false substance, you hear it in all the narrative, the framing of everything, new normal, uh, build back better. You're going to deny ourselves the opportunity to move forward. So gradually moving forward with confidence, never running in the fog, but relying on on instinct you know there's not a person on this call for whom it is not the most powerful tool they've got but in times like these we, we we cling for the falsehoods of a normality that once was there and find it hard to stay in the scary place of opportunity amazing i, I love the way you talk uh question here anonymous attendee again very shy people out there uh re blm is there a right and wrong way to affect mutiny Re-BLM, I think the thing that we should all be like getting our notebooks out and watching is the level of organization. Since emerging as a hashtag, just like the civil rights movement did, they've been waiting for the right opportunity organized. And just as George Floyd was, Rosa Parks was fully anticipated. It was guaranteed this was going to happen. And for the first time in our lifetime, you have got protests in every single state. You have peaceful protests everywhere. You've got systemic uh, strategic ambitions, defund the police, you know, that are so clearly made now, and there isn't a leader that can then be torn down. Uh, you've got the entire Democratic um, nominee uh, cabinet on their knees saying yes, and states taking it seriously. As a level of organization, every other goddamn protesting campaign from climate to wherever should take note. That is how to affect change appropriately. So it's not necessarily right or wrong, but goddamn, it's effective. Uh, I'm changing this question a little bit. Anonymous attendee asks, would a parrot help this government be more pirate and less shipwreck victims? But how, if, you, if you were looking at the government and you were their advisor, you were Dominic Cummings, Dominic Cummings, how could they be more pirate? Well, it's that shocking statistic that, you know, the person with the longest tenure has got two years and I think there's only three industries uh, represented at the, at the table. So you've got this like most diverse government everywhere, which just shows how one dimensional the opportunity to use diversity against itself can be. Um, and, you know, and, and in, in many ways, you know, I've been asked that a lot, is coming, coming as a pirate and it's cool to bring different thinking and certainly it was a pirate move. But, you know, he, in truth, he's just a twat. So the, the, the truth that I discovered about pirates was a level of accountability, was a level of responsibility, was a fight for fairness. And, and in my opinion, Cummings doesn't represent any of those. Well, in, in, in the certainly it would seem retrospectively the opinion of the law as well. Um, so it's that opportunity of balancing, you know, diversity and radical thinking, but in the spirit of, 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 of distribution power in a fair, and responsible and accountable way. Sam, I love you. You are brilliant. Thank you so much. See you again soon. Thanks for joining us. Love you too. Bye-bye. Now we're now moving on to another of my favourite people. It's Amy Keane. Uh, I don't know what she's going to do. It's always slightly odd and surprising, but Amy, you've got 99 seconds. Of course I have. I'm going to warn you off if you go over. Sure. Fine. Do I start now? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't know where to start, Justin. <laughs> I'm starting now, okay? Go, go, go. Okay, right. 
The other day, I did one of those expensive personality tests, which told me I was something called a game changer. Now, I've never actually changed any games, although I do credit myself with inventing strip monopoly. The test said a game changer is someone who likes to solve old problems in new ways. They want everything to be better, braver. Sound familiar? It means you're made for innovation. It also means you're a bit mad. After my test results, I became curious. Who was the original game changer? Any guesses? Pythagoras, the first known innovator, the dude with the right angled triangles. Pythagoras had his quirks. He had a fear of fava beans. He thought men were odd numbers and women even. He was a feminist in the year 490 BC. He believed dogs were the reincarnated souls of his friends. He had a cult. He was utterly mad. Yet he contributed more to philosophy and the advancement of knowledge than most other humans. I'm here to tell you it's okay to be Pythagoras. If you are made for innovation, you are are restless, you're difficult, you're also a little mad because you have to be. And this is the serious part. Innovation, the real valuable stuff, is hard, it's lonely, you'll be met with resistance. People will think you're weird and they'll shoot down your ideas. I dread to think of the change that didn't happen because someone was told their idea was weird. Game changers are told they're problematic, but if you're a game changer, you are not the problem. It's just some people aren't ready for you yet. Uh, my consultancy and us, we work with brands to make innovation a more normal thing in organisations so that no one feels weird or unheard or left out because that would be absolute madness. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Second, that was amazing. Wow. I rehearsed. Lots of questions, but we're moving on. I love you. I'll see you I love soon. you too. I'll see you soon. Right. Amazing. Amazing you did it in time. I didn't get to hold you up and press that. Well, our next, our next speaker is, it's Martin Bentley, he's Commercial Director UK at Audience Project. Martin, you've got 99 seconds and that starts now. All right, thank you. Um, yes, Martin Bentley from Audience Project. Um, I've seen some great stuff this week on the 99 Festival. I've got to call out Joe from Audience Project and Sam Gordon from uh, Working 50 for mentioning how important audience accuracy and measurement is. I'm also going to take to heart what Spotify said about the power of audio to help get a message across. And with that, I'm going to actually use the power of audio or sound to try and do my review, uh, calling on what I do outside of work to do that. So here we go. It's called the Measurement Blues. <laughs> woke up last week with the measurement blues. What I've heard at Madfest is pretty good news. There's talk of change and the pace is fast. We must be inclusive so no one is last. When it comes to reach and effective scale, the tools are here now to ensure you don't fail. If we work together across the divide, we'll all emerge stronger and we'll enjoy the ride. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, and uh, apologies to my team. Superb, you didn't even get hold of, I never do that. Thank you so much. Absolutely super. Absolutely super. So now moving on, moving on to Tom Huxtable, CEO Director, Analytic Partners, and let's see if you've got a solo. We've got 99 seconds now, starting now. Thank you, I've got no uh, music for you, but I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, it's an innovation day, so I just want to talk about the great innovators in history, Pythagoras being one of them, but I think history says there's one that stands head and shoulders or maybe warm and safe above others. And that's the third little piggy from the little piggies. He innovated and he built the house the wolf couldn't blow down. Medium mixed modeling or MMM. And if you're not hundred percent sure, it's the art and science of measuring the impact of and optimizing the performance of marketing is a little like the three piggies. There's always someone internally, an anomalous event or a lack of data around to be the wolf and blow your house down. Now imagine along comes piggy number four, they wouldn't build another brick house. They would think of all the walls around today and not only make the house fit for purpose today, but also for the future. Just like the Piggy, MMM programs need to be future-proofed. What would Piggy number four think now? 
they think about the weather. They're definitely considerate when designing the house. It's the same with marketing performance. Weather has a huge impact on things like footfall. It'd be custom designed. They wouldn't just pull it off a shelf. They'd want to design it to suit their needs today and tomorrow. In fact, to future proof, Mr. and Mrs. Piggy number four needs to have thought of all the variables that meet that their home needs today and tomorrow. MMM is just like that. It's not enough just to consider marketing and media. The other external factors, weather, inventory, resourcing, agility, etc., need to be in the mix. Otherwise, the wolf will come and blow your house down. Be more piggy. Innovate your media mix modeling and stay warm and safe regardless of what the future holds. Thank you. Be more, be more piggy is the best call I've heard. Don't be pirate, be more piggy. Absolutely. I stole that line, I admit. <laughs> Tom, brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. On to Ed Freedy. Ed, who did a great talk earlier, and we've got some, some, some superb questions this week. Ed, this is your last chance to wow us this week. Yeah. Oh. Now. All right, well, thank you, Justin, and the team for a really great event. It's been some great stuff. I wanted to pull out some themes that I thought were relevant for conversational advertising and where perhaps uh, the art of conversation could help. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, and uh, what, what I was hearing a lot that struck a chord with me was the need for authenticity and for advertisers and brands to find their real voice and build real connections with their customers. So we feel that there's an obvious role for conversations to play with uh, a two-way interaction to really determine that and use that mechanism to find your own voice. Uh, next slide, please. And then also the other factor that listening, uh, especially uh, over the last few months, listening to your customers, to potential customers, to your audiences, um, and the conversational mechanism we feel gives you a real uh, benefit and advantage to do that because the users have many more interactions with a, within a conversation than just a one way advert. So I felt that that was definitely a theme where conversation could help. Next slide, please. And then finally, the need to keep innovating, uh, to keep testing, uh, being resourceful and delivering value. Uh, conversational advertising modernizes the display experience into the era of messaging, which is more uh, what people are used to doing now and want to do. Uh, they're easy to build, uh, which is very resourceful, and they deliver great ROI. Uh, last slide. Oh, last one. Oh, sorry, Ed. Oh, been that, that was it. That was all I had to say anyway. So. Amazing. Thank you so much. You've really been Thank great. you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Cheers. Everyone. Now we're moving on to Amy Kelly. She's the director of the oh. Computer Testing. Amy, you have 99 seconds starting now. So ask yourself, do I really know my customers? It sounds simple enough to speak to customers, but you'd be surprised by how many campaigns are actually launched without considering the voice of the customer. According to the CX industry report from 2020, it's 50% of marketing campaigns that are not tested. As marketers, we try to understand our audience through NPS scores, engagement data, survey data, but we now have an opportunity to open our eyes and listen and see that there are more effective ways for us to truly learn and understand our audience. Getting feedback doesn't have to mean conducting time intensive market research or planning really expensive focus groups that take weeks. Today, you can get on demand human insights about all of your marketing campaigns in a matter of hours via the user testing platform. Because business is human, insights drive innovation. Marketers need to tap into the human perspective to make those smart marketing decisions. We need to innovate now through listening to real people. In the past, we've relied heavily on big data to help us paint the picture of who our customer is and how they act online to inform how we then market to them. But how do they feel and what are they even saying when they're looking at your brand? So I now invite all of you to join this movement to incorporate the voice of your customer into your marketing. Reach out to me or anyone else from user testing that's at the event to find out how loads of brands are already doing that just now and launch that next campaign with confidence. Thank you. Oh, Amy, yay. amazing timing. Well done. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Now we are moving on to our next speaker, which is Solanity for Ages, the 
honestly, honestly, honestly incredible Shibby Jibs. Shibby, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? I can. can. How are you doing? Can you go? Yeah. So can I go? Can you hear me? Yeah. Go two seconds. Go. Not one second. Start. Okay. Now, I know some folks may still think that technology is kind of clinical. So last night, Justin, it struck me, why not make this a little lyrical? Now, bear with me. I'm a futurist, not a poet. And trust me when I say I know it. So there's a way that your brain will store four times more fine neuroscience. And this tactic is being used right now by IKEA, ASOS, Adidas, and Heinz. When we're in a pandemic summer faced with our grim mortality, might it help if brands enlivened us with just a little bit of mixed reality? Grab your phone, aim your camera at a surface, and then activate. And a person, a product, or a place overlays in a realistic state. Or try loaning your client a HoloLens for your pitch to be elevated. Please skip the bullet points and PowerPoints. This will get you rated. We get to choose a version of immersion that audiences will see. Mixed reality lets you switch it up for B2B, B2C, or B2B2C. Now, whatever permutation, we're just looking for real, true storytelling, not shouty slogans or pouty Insta faces. That's just too much hard selling, well, for me anyway. Now, trust me, mixed reality, when done well, will crank up the ability to take folks along for the ride beyond just plain connectivity. <laughs> Out. <laughs> Amazing. Absolutely incredible. This has been a real musical day today. So we haven't seen each other for ages. We've got a few minutes left. But what have you been up to in the last 10 years since I've seen you? Oh, my gosh. So I was head of uh, digital media Telefonica. I then left and set up my own innovation forecasting lab, which is absolutely fascinating. I get to work with organizations and governments and travel all around the world to do keynotes, which is fascinating, uh, but also really dig my heels into particular projects and kind of get under the hood of what everyone uh, needs from their storytelling and to find those innovations that will really have staying power, not just the blink and you'll miss it stuff. Okay, so today's, today's the innovation day at the Nice Line Festival. What one innovation are you most excited about at the moment? So I spoke in this case about augmented reality and mixed reality, right? But there's something called a web of touch that not many people know about. And the guys at King's College are actually making this happen. Imagine, Justin, if you could actually start to send the sense of touch across the web. That just blows your mind. And there's a lot of tech and science behind it. I won't go into that. But it's something worth looking up. King's College, Web of Touch, phenomenal. Imagine, I could shake your hand right here and you could feel it. Ooh, amazing. I've liked that. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. Right. Now we're now coming to the very last, very, very, very last speaker of the day, which is very sad, but also... It's an amazing speaker, again, someone I've known for a fair amount of time now, James Kirkham. He was uh, huge in the early days of digital marketing, uh, and he recently joined Defected, which is a quite a shock to me, because it's one of the best labels around. Uh, definitely one of the most innovative labels around. James, haven't seen you for a while now, so it'll be great to see you face-to-face -face in a weird sort of virtual way. Uh, you're gonna have 99 seconds, and then will be you'll have the last questions of the whole festival. So for the last time, everyone, for the last time, everyone, boss me your screen, look at the Q&A icon, send me your questions, and I'll pick the best and put them to James. This is the last chance you'll ever, ever have to ask questions at the 99 Festival oh, this, yeah, week. Well, this week. This week. Unless we go on until next week. Uh, and don't, everyone, hang on. We've got, we've got the defective record, an exclusive mix, next question for us, coming straight after James. So without further ado, James, it's over to you, 99 seconds, and the last chance for me to use my horn. Go. Uh, what an honour to close this uh, brilliant event. Well done all. Um, listen, we're in a pretty hard era, hard times. It's a difficult time. It was bad enough before we started talking about pandemics with Trump's walls going up, with uh, Brexit dividing this kind of nation, with the social toxicity everywhere. We've had trade wars. We've got culture wars. We've got real wars. Um, but... I do believe that we're in an era and a time that that's actually going to lead to something pretty special and quite magical. And hopefully uh, we're going to witness an explosion of creativity. Defected, as you say, is a, is a label, a record label. It's about house music. And there's a line from Honey Dijon that is dance floors unite people in a way that governments and religions never could. We believe that whether it be in Ibiza or in a festival in Croatia, and we've even believed it recently with a way we can do that on a virtual dance floor too. 
So even tonight when we're on platforms like Twitch trying to bring people together, it's about unifying and allowing them to express themselves in a way that they might have always done. So despite all of this madness and all of this hardship and all of that pretty hard times that we're witnessing, I genuinely believe just like punk in the 70s or like rave and acid house in the 80s, we're about to see an explosion of creativity like nothing before. A richness that we can actually indulge in and that's gonna take us through into something quite special and epic next. Amazing. I was not five seconds. Fantastic, James. Hey. Incredible stuff. I've got some questions coming in. Uh, there's a question here from Caitlin. When does Printworks reopen? I want to get back on it. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know the answer, but, um, and I'm not a government advisor, so maybe not one for me. <laughs> but it's a good question for me. You know, we've known each other for a long time. When I, see, I saw you go to Fex, it was a sort of quest, a pleasant shock. So why a record label? You know, why did you go there after you just looked Copper 90, which is a huge success in the sports arena? Why um, yeah, well, I was lucky enough to do four years in football at Copper 90 after agency days. It's probably best expressed. Some wag on my Instagram wrote when he saw my announcement that I'd moved to Defected. He said, you're the only man I know who's managed to make a career out of his own hobbies. Uh, and I think it's something to do with the fact you've got to pursue what you enjoy, haven't you? I bloody love music and I used to love football and still do. But I've always wanted to. I'm quite old now. I wanted to try and do it before I uh, got too old to join a, a record label. And, and here I am. And it's, it's brilliant. It's a bizarre time to be doing anything, as we all know as you're so brilliantly executing today with this, uh, we're managing those to still be noisy and relevant and putting out great music in this time, which is, yeah, a pleasure to be a part of. Amazing. So a question for me again, look, so we knew each other way back in the early days of digital, which was just kicking off. Looking back with that umbrella that you've got, what do you think of the digital media marketing industry now? You know, how, how far, how well has it done? How far has it got yet to go? Um, I don't know if I ever see it now separated. Yeah, I mean, we, everything was kind of interactive this or like new media, that kind of, we, almost we, we started in a time where you had to create that divide because you had to pinpoint what it was doing. But I don't know, it's like social media. I just see it now as like, you don't talk about, you know, using electricity to turn on a light. I just see it as a simile, it just permeates and is a part of every single thing. I still think, you know, there's a relevance and an importance for the right agencies to do the right stuff. Perhaps in recent years, there's been a lot of soul searching from Adland and interactive, if you like, what it used to be and, you know, and digital agencies and maybe platforms and passions took over the places like Copper 90, the lab Bibles of this world, your vices and stuff like that. I think ultimately, though, as long as everyone bears influence on the world around them with wicked ideas that happen to be connected digitally, then it, we're all going to be in great shape. Nice, very summing it up. Got a question here from Mark that I think might be the last ever question, but I like it, so it might be, I think. Oh, there's a new one here, I like it. Okay, second last question. Uh, <laughs> music still has its boundaries. Dance floors are full of those similar to, to you, whereas in a, in a club across the road, it could be a whole different tribe. How can music overcome the genre boundaries and help overcome our other boundaries? I think, I think music's just still this ultimate common denominator. I mean, sport and music for me always are. It's the classic cliche, you can go anywhere in the world, get in the back of a taxi, and you can either speak about, I don't know, house music or Man United Football Club, something like that. They're ridiculous connectors in that respect. You know, Defected are fortunate, and the likes of Glitterbox, where Katie Goodman is DJing for you guys later on, is representative of, it's this brilliant, all access, anything goes, hugely welcoming, fantastic embracing of LGBTQ plus culture, like absolutely anyone and anything from anywhere. And that's got to be right and appropriate, never been more appropriate, in fact. So an ability to bring people together and unify is what music can do. And there aren't many things that can do it at quite that level. Excellent. I've got two loads of really good questions. So I'm just going to just pick one very, very last question. It's from James Steele. Just these are so many good questions throughout the week. Do you think rave was the last great cultural revolution? Everything yeah. since, I do, everything since has, has, has just been spin. I think everything since has been more eclectic. Like, I hate using the terms like this, but like a shuffle generation did occur. And I don't think that's a bad thing. And, and look at playlist culture. If you look at my playlist now, it's quite ludicrously diverse from soul and house and hip hop and disco. That's kind of cool. That came from the shuffle generation. But yeah, rave was definitely the last big movement alongside, you know, 
Rave slash maybe Britpop, you could argue, you know, which again, I happen to have been a big fan of back then, back at art college when I was about 18 years old. But it's definitely Rave that um, probably caught light a little bit more and actually influenced an awful lot more of us, the likes of house culture and everything that stemmed from it. Amazing, James, you were our last speaker. You're amazing. Thank you so much. I'm about to go to the Fetch of House Party again. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So everybody, thank you so much for spending the week with us. It's been an incredible week. We've heard some absolutely amazing speakers. We've heard poetry, we've heard games, we've heard songs, we've heard everything. So I think now in a second we're going to tune off. Ian, Andy, Dan, somewhere about everyone says thank you so much. It has been the best week. We'll carry on, as Ian said before, on the defectors. Defectors? <laughs> on the, on the Madfest app and site and on new, di new digital age as well. We're going to probably sit and get drunk. Everyone <laughs> stay and enjoy the Defected House Party. Thank you so much for joining us. See you again soon. Bye bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Hands up, y'all. We move. Hands up, y'all. We dance. Hands up, y'all. We move. Hands up, y'all. We dance. Hands up, y'all. We move. Hands up, y'all. We dance. Hands up, y'all. We move. Hands up, y'all. We dance.